Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I know um, we just have 30 minutes here. We wanna thank everybody for uh, jumping on. I know everybody is extremely busy. I'm Casey English. I'm the uh, Director of Business Development for CWDL. I'd like to uh, get started by welcoming Troy Garris, founder and managing member of Garris Horn LLP. Troy is a business owner's lawyer, priding himself on a results-oriented, pragmatic approach to addressing legal issues in the financial services world. Troy deals with federal and state compliance, enforcement defense, company formation, and mergers and acquisitions. In these areas, Troy represents independent mortgage bankers, community banks, lenders, servicers, title companies, secondary market investors, and equity funds. Troy is active in the mortgage banking industry, and in 2007, the Mortgage Bankers Association named him to the Future Leaders Program. We also have Mark Wilson, CPA. Mark is the founder of CWDL, a rapidly growing assurance and tax and consulting firm dedicated to servicing the mortgage industry. CWDL is passionate about helping entrepreneurs realize their goals through the development of key performance indicators, tax planning, and providing a clear understanding of accounting data to make informed business decisions. CWDL has va a vast client services offering, including MBFRF reporting, subservicing oversight, and accounting software implementation and cleanup for AMB, Loan Vision, and QuickBooks. Prior to starting CWDL, Mark founded and sold a privately held independent mortgage bank, served as a CFO for multiple financial service firms, and participated in raising capital as well as M&A transactions. Mark's background provides him with a unique client side perspective that allows him to understand the needs of CWDL's clients. Welcome, Mark. We're extremely lucky to have both industry experts on with us today uh, about uh, LL litigation and how to mitigate risk. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Use the um, Q&A function to ask any questions. We're gonna do our best to get to them, but if we run out of time, we will address them individually after, and each of you will be sent a recording of the webinar. With that, let's get started. Sounds good. Thank you, Casey, for the introduction. Um, I'm super happy to have Troy on the call today. Um, we it's, it's really is a treat to have an expert on this particular topic, and I know when we picked it, it was, um, it, 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 it was it was it was great because we have lots of clients that have questions about loan officer compensation. We have had many clients um, get involved with litigation, some other issues. So, um, thanks for for doing this today, Troy, and and collaborating with us on this particular topic. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Casey, also for the introduction. Very kind words, and um, yeah, we have some some kind of thorny and common questions that uh, we have on our list today. We're gonna to try to squeeze as much as we can into the 30 minutes and we probably won't get to everything, but hopefully we'll get to some of the more pithy kind of conversations. And uh, so Mark, if, if I'm okay, just kicking up on, on LO comp, that actually is something that I spent a lot of time on and have for a long time. And, uh, you know, one of the key areas that I see, and I'm guessing that you see as well, is in the, in the concept of what do you do with branch managers, some of whom are producing, some of whom are allegedly at least not producing, and, and how do you uh, make sure that you're not falling into, uh, you know, a, a, a situation where you treating somebody incorrectly? Because typically, in, in my experience, what I'm seeing is that people who are trying to be classified as non-producers, they want to get paid on a profits basis or some basis that's not acceptable under LO comp rules. And, and I don't know if that's similar to what you're seeing as well, but maybe you could share a little bit of your insight. No, I think I think that's right. I think we, we see that a lot. Um, you know, typical branch model, you'll have um, you'll have the, the 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 branch manager who may or may not originate and want to be paid on the profitability of that particular branch. And so there are particular issues that come up um, and we get questions often from, from clients asking about what, what is compliant? What, is, what can we do? What, what right. should we be doing in these particular situations? Yeah, and um, so I, th that, yeah, I have a, a similar kind of experience and, and I do, I, I will say, and I think everybody knows this, but just to be clear, paying profits to a person who's covered by LO comp is not allowed, it just isn't. And there are a lot of other things that are not allowed Not allowed. also. The, the basic rule is you can't pay based on terms of a loan, can't pay based on a proxy for terms of a loan. And so those 
um, you, you know, those profits are deemed by the CFPB to be uh, terms or, or a bundle of terms of the loans. And so that's just not permitted. Well, one, one thing that people often do uh, as, as far as, or, or think about doing at least is that they'll say, well, I have this producer and we want to pay him profits, but we got to get him to a non-producer role in order to do that. So how about we just call him a non-producer? And that just doesn't work. You got to make sure that the person really isn't engaged in any of those loan originator activities in order to be paid on a on a um, non-producer basis. And it's it's kind of hard because it's so ingrained in a lot of the people that are branch managers. They're they're usually awesome at sales, and they usually have a a long long list of people that just call them from time to time because they're they're moving or they're refining or somebody got referred over by a friend. And so people call that branch manager. And once that branch manager starts talking to a consumer, that person very likely and very easily can slip into a producer kind of a role. And at that point, you wouldn't be able to be paying profits anymore or, or any other way that that's not LO comp permitted. Um, but it's but it's a big issue, I think. I, I also see in, in the same category a lot of people that will have a, a like a couple so there's the one spouse is a producer paid on LO comp covered compliant basis another another spouse is a, a non-producer and paid on a, a often a profits basis or net profits basis and that you know it's it's an area that is largely unexplored there is certainly room for the the agencies to to call that an impermissible kind of a of a compensation structure. Um, I I've talked with even at the CFPB them itself. I've talked with uh, some people who say yeah that should be fine, and I've talked with other people who say yeah we can't we can't have you doing that because direct or indirect compensation covers is covered rather. And so if I'm paying this, the one spouse on profits and then they share bank accounts and they j file joint taxes and they own everything together and it's community property, it can be an indirect compensation structure. It's, it's still largely unexplored, but uh, as far as legally, but there's th certainly some risk there and, and something people want to think about in, uh, in terms of how they structure that. Y you know, something, something else that I see, Mark, and I don't know if you see this a lot too, but even today, I run into people probably once a month, maybe once every two months on average, where somebody is paying differently. To These are two loan originator covered people now. This is not the non-producer. So you have a LO or a branch manager who's covered, and they're paying differently based on whether the loan is one type of a loan or a different type yeah. of a loan. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about lead source, right? So if you have this self-generated lead versus uh, a, a company provided lead, um, they might have a different comp structure for each one of those leads. What are you seeing from a compliant perspective? Um, and I think yeah. that, that's so, pretty, that's real common, especially especially um, originators that have a consumer direct channel and a retail channel. Right. So those are the two areas that we see that. Yeah, so this, this entire, area of the world is, is really just risk management. And, yeah. and um, you know, in, in that regard, so there are arguments that, that you can pay differently based on whether self-generated or company generated. There, there are risks there, including that a lot of times loan officers can figure out ways to switch channels. So if, if the loan yeah. officer wants to move a loan from one channel to the other for, for some reason, uh, oftentimes it's concession driven then they might do that. And so it, it, it is an area that, that probably you can structure something that is, a, is at a risk, a risk level that most risk appetites can tolerate. But, but that said, you really gotta make sure that you think through it, you understand what the risks are and you, you make sure that you have controls in place so that you know, people, creative people, and, and you know, I love LOs in part because they're so creative, uh, but you know, they can find ways to change, uh, for example, one lo a loan from one channel to another, just because it's allowed and maybe the company didn't really think through that part of it. And it's not necessarily even nefarious, it's just their understanding of how the system works. That's right, and, and I, think, I think that brings up a good point. Um, 
concessions. Uh, concessions yeah. are a big part of, of this particular um, topic. Um, you know, I, oftentimes we'll go into a, a, to a client on a consulting basis and, and they have LL comp and they have their target um, company margin that's built into to their model. And, um, and they're not realizing it. And that's oftentimes because they have loan officers coming in frequently for concessions. So um, I think and most people understand, and maybe you can expand on what the rules are as it relates to concessions. But, right. um, you know, if you're, if, if you're paying in a compliant way, obviously the concessions only hit the company. The loan officer generally isn't uh, participating in those concessions. So um, maybe you can let us, you know, talk yeah. through that a little bit and what your thoughts are and maybe some pitfalls that you've seen. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So the concessions almost entirely, there are some very small slivers where concessions, I wouldn't really call them concession, but where some loan level charges might be able to charge back to a loan officer if you set up your agreements properly, but almost exclusively if you have a concession, it means the company is eating whatever the cost of that is. It, it cannot be the loan officer. It cannot be the producing branch manager. Uh, it's, it's just not allowed. There, is a, there has been for a number of years now, a, a push at the MBA to, to convince the CFPB to change that thinking so that some concessions would be allowed. But at least at the moment, it's, it's not allowable. And so that's where, that's one of the areas too, where we see a lot of people just at the loan officer level, the branch manager level, trying to figure out ways to change a, a loan from one kind of a category to another so that they can take into account the concessions in a way that somehow gets them, gets the consumer maybe a better rate or a lower fee, but also somehow gets the, the loan officer a lower amount that that person's being paid. And, and again, it's, it's not permitted. And so it's it's the kind of thing that the company's compliance officers and and operational people and management definitely want to make sure that they understand and do some good training too. You know that the the, the LO comp um, rule comes with some some real teeth, and when you think about these types of, of violations, often people think of it as well, it's just a minor thing, right? So on one loan, this guy was able to uh, move, you know, pay differently on whatever the category. We paid differently on a bond loan as compared to some other loan. And he only did four bond loans last year. Yeah. So so they think of it as, as a minor problem, probably never gonna surface. If it does surface, probably never get in trouble. And and it's not necessarily that limited pool of loans that that are at issue because if you're paying differently on bond loans, as an example, you're also paying differently on all those other non-bond loans. And each one of those could be viewed as a violation. And the violations can rack up pretty, pretty substantially. There's, there's been a few settlements, as, as most people know, in this area. And the settlements have been in the multiple millions of dollars in civil money penalties paid to the CFPB. And they went after the principals in those cases and management in those cases as well. So it's, a, it's an area that you really want to be careful about because if you get it wrong, you're kind of rubber stamping the violation each time you do it. Yeah, and there's precedence for how it gets paid out because there's yeah, the, the, you've, we've seen it happen across the board. So um, be careful, right? Um, yeah. You know, I think the other side of that qu equation is we, we, we were just talking about concessions. Um, what about these overage accounts or, um, you know, oftentimes, there, there was a time they called them point banks, which universally we've, we've learned that, you know, are not okay. But um, this idea or concept that um, you either have a branch or a loan officer that's outperforming, I mean, they're, they're hitting a, a bigger margin than expected. Um, right. what, and, and, you know, what's interesting is, you know, in 2018, of course, we didn't see much of that. Um, 2019 was much better. And I, I would say 2020 is going to be quite large, right? I mean, I, I anticipate there's going to be these, these retail branch models that might have some of that. Um, um, and so maybe right. you can talk a little bit through the rules around what that looks like. Um, we, you know, obviously from our audit side, we have some, some strong opinions on that, but sure. um, um, I'd like to see what 
you know, from your side of the table, what's that look like? Yeah. So, so, you know, there are different names that people give to these types of concepts. So some people will call them overages, some people will call them overrides, some people will call them point banks. And all of those can have, all those terms have multiple meanings depending on who you're talking to and, and at the time you're talking to them. Right. And it, it could be some regional variations as well, I've found. But, but the basic concept that I, that I think of this is it's money that is either it has been earned by the loan officer or more commonly the branch manager, but has not yet been paid out. And so it raises a bunch of issues. One of the biggest issues in my mind is, is from FHA, because most of the people that we're talking about um, having this sort of volume is probably going to be FHA approved. FHA has rules against requiring anybody other than the company from paying, uh, preventing anyone from co- besides the company from paying any sort of operating costs. And so if the branch manager has money that's owed to him or her, and the company is keeping that money and using it to pay for whatever it is, uh, some sort of cost of the branch or, or anything else for that matter, FHA is going to take issue with it. And the, the question of FHA always brings in the question of False Claims Act and um, that, those problems can spiral out of control. You can lose your approval, you can get some money penalties, but the False Claims Act really stands out there as a, a huge hammer that, that FHA and when it gets involved, Department of Justice um, can come after people with. There's been you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of jury awards against uh, companies in that regard, and it can be a huge problem. And it can, again, it can be one of those problems that it's not just against the companies, it's against individuals that are involved. Um, so that's one thing. Another, another aspect that's a problem is that if you have an employee, whoever it is, but it includes branch managers, and that person has actually earned income, most uh, states' laws on unemployment law side and also the federal employment law require you to pay that money out at the next regular scheduled pay date. So you have the employment law issue there too of not promptly and, and properly paying out compensation to people that, um, you know, that, that have earned income. And, and much of this can really be structured around so that you're operating in a compliant manner. And you know, I've designed a lot of, of comp plans over the years where we can get to, it's not exactly that, it's not branch manager money sitting in an account waiting to pay for the branch expenses that go into losses, but it's really just a structuring issue. And does that person earn comp? And if so, when? And, and what's it based on? And, and most of that can be, we, we can get to a, a pretty similar result but not have the company at risk that way. Yeah, so through through writing the proper contracts, um, making sure that they are written in a way that are compliant goes a right. long way, right? And then and then the you know I think I think we will meet with clients often and say, well, it's not really necessarily deferred comp, but it's a promise to you know to support that particular branch or loan officer from additional marketing efforts, for example, and right. other periods of time. Um, does, is that looked at as compensation or have you seen any pitfalls with that relationship, that those type of agreements? Again, it's, it's kind of depending on how it's structured. I mean, company can use its money for really for whatever expenses or marketing it wants to. We just have to make sure that it's, it's company money and it's not branch manager or employee money. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that it's not, if, it, if the person's covered by LO comp rules, that it's not... Uh, compensation that's tied to or based on terms or proxies of loans, which is in some of these settlements they talk about, for example, point banks and some of those larger LO comp settlements. They didn't really define what it is. And and the CFPB has had some trouble over the years t- telling people exactly what they, they say that point banks, they've never seen one that's legal, but they don't really tell you what it is. And so you, you don't really know what they have in their minds and, you know, other people have different things in their minds sometimes. But the main, the main issue is that they have to, you, you, you go back to the rule, which is you can't pay based on terms or proxies for terms of loans. That's, yeah. that's at, at its heart. Right. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I want to remind people, make sure you ask questions as we get through this. We want to make sure if we don't get to your question, we'll come back and, and, and follow up with you, at least set up a call, maybe chat. 
Um, before, and we spent some time on LO Comp in particular, and before we go on to a, a different area, I want to make sure we touch on this idea of 1099 versus W-2. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, 2007 is long gone. Um, we've come through, uh, you know, quite a bit. Um, but we still, in mo most of our clients, if not all of them, are paying through W-2. Um, most sure. of them are FHA approved, and that's an absolute requirement. Right. And depending upon which state you're in, there's lots of different state rules. Right. I you know um, there's been a, additional guidance that have come out from a tax compliance perspective that makes it really hard to um, justify keeping these people as, as 1099s. Um, but maybe right. you can talk through that a little bit and what you're seeing out there. Um, and, and really, there's, and we can talk through what the risks are um, by keeping them on 1099. But I think... Um, yeah, so 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 1099, it, you know, it's just a tax form, right? So, yeah. um, yeah. non-employee payment, yeah, non-employee right. payment, yeah. So I, actually, I love talking with CPAs because you guys understand that a W two is just a form that you report to the IRS on, and 1099 is just a form you report to the IRS on. Right, employee and, versus independent contractor. That's really the issue, right? Yeah, right. And, and so if you're if you're an employee, your employer is going to report on a W-2 basis to the IRS and you, that's how you pay your and withhold taxes and so on. And an independent contract would be the 1099 version, right? And the, one of the big issues there, in addition to just the, the general risk of probably in our world with, with the very rare exception, probably in our world, mortgage banking, any of the tests that a regulator would run in terms of defining whether a person is an employee, therefore W-2 or a contractor, therefore 1099, it's going to be an employee. They they are sponsored by you on the NMLS. They have your name and your NMLS number on their websites, on their business cards, on everything that they do. It's your name, you know, the lender's name. It's you know you have controls over them. You do the training. I, I mean, they're employees. There's there's no question typically. Now there's some little areas that are a little unique and raise some different questions. For example, in California, where they have DRE sales, you know, Department of Real Estate sales license can get you the ability to do a loan. But even there, if you look at any of the regular employment tests, you're going to probably have an employee instead of a contractor. So that, that's the first step. But the second, I guess the flip side of that same question is, why the heck would anybody want a, a contractor on the on the its surface you think well the contractors are good because i don't have to pay their payroll taxes and so that's good they're responsible for that you know arguably i don't have responsibility for them if they you know if they do something wrong uh they're an independent contractor so you know it's not really me if they you know punch somebody in the nose but but also it means that under RESPA section 8 you don't qualify for an exemption in making payments to them when they send you loans, which is one of the cri critical points about, um, about the employee versus contractor type of analysis in this area, because there's a specific, there's specific language in the RESPA regulations that says you can pay an employee for a referral. And when a, when a person sends you a loan, that's a referral. Yep. As a general matter, right? And yep. so if a contractor sends you a loan and you pay for the pay that contractor, are you paying because that person is a broker? Or you, it's just unclear. So it raises That's these through a PPO channel, it's different, right? But right? but but if it's an originator and a loan's closing in your name and right. it's uh, put in there. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, there's there's a lot of people, you know, what you get kickback from is, you know everybody else, there's other people doing it or, you yep. know, and, and it makes it harder to recruit the loan officer. And, and we, we understand that. I mean, from, from a lender side, you know, oftentimes the, the, the owners of these independent bankers, their clients are the loan officers as they're recruiting right. them into their company. Right. And um, if the guy down the street is paying that person as a 1099 and, or as an independent contractor, or even as an, even paying their corporation, oftentimes we've, we've seen that and, Try yeah. to walk through that. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it makes them um, maybe in a less competitive arena because that loan officer wants to write off their other expenses and do other things. And so, um, 
you know, so there are there there is still some of that that we run into on occasion. So yeah. hey, Mark and Troy, I feel like this is a good time. We we have a question, and and it's real specific to what you guys are talking about right now. Thoughts on cool. several major national lenders offering a pick a pay option where yep. the loan officer um can can pick which pay scale or price sheet they want to work off sure. work off of. So um, any thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah it's so Oh, it, says make, it says I may get paid more than an LO in an office next door, but the rate sheet is higher than what he or she is charging as well. Right. Uh, and it says all, all in the same MSA. So, right. Um, yeah. What are yeah, your thoughts? So they, they tend to, the LO comp rules, even though you, arguably the LO comp rules don't allow that, the CFPB has, has read it to not prohibit that type of situation, but it raises real serious fair lending issues. Because just as Mark said, you got two two different LOs sitting side by side, perhaps even. And if I call LO one, I'm gonna get one rate. If I call LO two, I'm gonna get a different rate. And if it turns out that that happens often enough, and there's some correlation to gender, race, ethnicity, age, whatever it is, then there's gonna be a real fair lending issue. And and that's an issue that, as you can imagine, in this world, especially. Um, the CFPB has has been focused on pretty pretty heavily, and we can expect that that will continue or increase even. Got it. Okay, and one more question: um, Any issues when paying out commission once the loan is bought off the line versus the time of funding or closing? So I think what that means is they're delaying the time when they're going to pay compensation. So the question there is going to be: It's it it seems like a nuance, but it's an important one. You have to define when that compensation is earned. And you're gonna do that in the agreement. So you gotta set up the, the compensation uh, formula properly so that the person doesn't earn compensation until certain things happen. So the person originates or does all the work to originate the loan. Maybe they, the loan gets closed, maybe it gets funded. You can build in a variety of different criteria for when that person earns that compensation. But as soon as the compensation is earned, next payday, and you can calculate it, next payday, you gotta pay that person according to your agreement. So that's, in a nutshell, that's that's the way to do it. So it's it's possible to delay, but you gotta make sure that that's what your contract actually says. Yeah, and, and, and you wanna be and you wanna be consistent on how you treat it, right? Um, Correct. I would say, I'd say as far as what we experience um, from our clients across the country, I, I'd say most of those are you know as soon as the loan funds they qualify for the commission and then um and and the timing of it varies from either you know two weeks post funding to very next pay period they, that 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 part's that part's um varies but the vast majority of them it's the funding that triggers the earning not selling it off the line per se because we have a lot of we have a lot of you know They'll move it off the line, but they, you know, they end up servicing that loan. It'll never, you know, so, so it's usually the funding is the trigger, but um, right. so I'd say as far as being consistent, consistent is the most important piece of that puzzle. And then um, followed by, you know, um, just following your particular internal policy. Yeah, for sure. So, so Mark, we're, I, we're running short on time out already. Yeah. Actually. I, yeah. I need this. Let's move on. Have a bunch yeah, let's, of stuff here. Let, let, about, let's, go ahead. What were you going to bring up? I was going to say, the movement of loan officers is another yeah. very frequent issue yeah. that comes up. And, and so people are, are aware out there, I think, that there's been this problem, and it, it continues to be a problem, and I have a couple of cases right this minute, yeah. where what, what's happening is, you know, you have an LO who has a, a long list of clients, and people have been calling him or her for a long time, and they refer people over, and so they come in with the, you know, the the virtual version these days of a Rolodex. And so they have all these contacts. And that's why you hire, that's why a lender hires people, right? Is that the, they're star producers. That's what you want, right? But there's a real fuzziness when people start in people's minds about when they start thinking whose contact and whose information that is. So if I'm a loan officer and I walk into your shop and you hire me and I have 500 people's names and phone numbers with me, when I do that, there's, on the one hand, I'm thinking of it as these are my people, not yours, and I'm not giving them to you. And if I leave, I'm taking them. 
so so there's a question there as to whose are they really because maybe i left some other company and brought that with me and so does it belong to this other company this prior employer or does it belong to me and there's i don't think there's a real clear answer there and and then and i i know that people differ on what they believe that information is and similarly if I go to work for, for the new company and then I start building up additional contacts because that's what I do and then I want to leave there, do I take the original 500? Do I take people? Do I take uh, zero people? Do I take the 500 plus whatever I built up there? Like, what is that? And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different regulations that come into play. For example, of course, the lenders have, as financial institutions have privacy and, and data security provisions that apply to them. So they need to make sure that they're not letting people walk off with borrower information. Similarly, the LOs believe, they tend to believe that this information belongs to them and that's how they make their livelihood and they they view it as they can't if they don't have that information. And and they may not even come to work with you if they if they they think that you're going to somehow try to prevent them from taking so at least some of that type of information with them when they leave. So it it really does create this this kind of netherworld of, of activities where people are trying to figure out ways to get out the door with information, sometimes even loan data information, but not, even if you're not even talking about that, even if you're talking about the, you know, the, num- the lists of people, that's all potentially covered by a Federal Trade Secrets Act, various state trade secrets act, because every state has one, and, and then basic uh, privacy laws under, under various states' provisions. Yeah, I, I would, I would add, like, you know, obviously loan officer, compens- loan officer contracts and agreements are important in this particular yeah. circumstance. Um, sure. So uh, if you have LOs working for you, you know, first of all, make sure it's clear. A loan starts at your company. It's your loan regardless of whether or not the loan officer is with, with you. Um, I think typically there's uh, some trailing commissions that generally have to be paid out. Um, we've had we've had um, multiple um, clients have litigation on both sides of this of, of this situation um, where a loan started with a particular lender um, that LO left and took that borrower, like you said, to the new lender. Um, and I will say, I don't know if, I mean, at least in our experience, we've, we've come in to help calculate damages and other things on that side. Right. Um, almost always there's a payout, you know, yeah. from old, old lender to new lender. Um, and so, you know, just that, that's a, that's a pretty common thing that happens. So I would be careful on that um, as we yeah. see. Um, and, and I think- Go ahead. You also have the, the question of if, if you find out that somebody left with that data, do you have to notify the state AG? Sometimes you might. Do you yep. have to notify the consumer? Sometimes you might. Yep. It's it's a real problem. Yep, real problem. Um, kind of rapid fire. We're, we're, we want I want to respect everybody's time on the thirty minutes. Um, and, and I I know it's that was a fast thirty minutes. So I don't know it went quick. Um, but. Real quick, let's go through. Um, so we talked about moving loans. Maybe the big, big things in the news: um, advertising, getting people in trouble. Um, maybe you can talk through that real quick. What you're seeing? Sure. Um, we've we've seen some settlements in the media um, coming right. out for our um, for lending. Go ahead. What what do you? Yeah. See? So so big area here is the CFPB. Even the current CFPB has been pushing this this uh, strategy of making sure that people reach out and market to all areas, all demographics, all to everyone. And in part, it stems from the CFPB trying to overreach in terms of the, the, the um, requirements of ECOA and on, on the HUD side, the, the Fair Housing Act, but um, they're trying to impose kind of a, a, a Community Reinvestment Act, uh, uh, kind of an obligation on independent mortgage companies. So it's an area that that uh, you need to watch out for. Again, I, I think the CFPB has, has continues to be focused on fair lending and, and probably will be so more so even going forward. Um, but that's a big area. Also, just in terms of the various like uh, platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever other uh, types of media platforms people might use, loan officers in particular might use. You, gotta, you know, you got to make sure that they have 
they, you know, if they're marketing loans that they have their MLS numbers on there and they have, you know, whatever other licensing information they might need to state by state. Um, so that's important. Um, and, you know, rates and, and, and uh, other information that are on advertisements. Uh, typically, an advertisement in social media is just like an advertisement in print. There's some variations, but, you know, the rules, generally speaking, try to get to the same thing. And so, you, you know, you got to make sure that you have some kind of pre-approved process where you know what the loan officers are, are advertising or managers are advertising. What about rates and things that, that are put on these, um, like flyers and, you know, and postcards uh, promising yeah. certain rates? And, you know, we see it, it's usually a consumer, oftentimes we'll see in a consumer direct um, right. model. What are you seeing? What's yeah, so, I mean, what, what, what can they say? What, 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 what can they get in real trouble? By yeah. 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 Frequently, like they, they will use, people will use trigger terms. And so under, under various provisions, state and federal, both, you, you have to include certain information. So for example, if you put an interest rate, you have to include the APR and you have to include a scenario that that's based on. It has to be relatively fresh, depending on the type of medium that, that it's in. And it, it really, I mean, that really could be a, a topic for a whole, a whole training session. Yeah. Um, but, but really what the, the company should be doing is making sure that they have some pre-approved product that they've seen before. And you, you don't have to uh, re-approve every time you uh, have a different iteration where it's a different face or a different house printed on the, or, or on the, on the advertisement, but the, the general content of the, of the advertisement should be pre-approved and then the company the loan officers have some flexibility in, in sending that information out great great i uh i, I see a couple of questions come in that are, are more along the line of hazing questions towards me yes but yes yes jim um i i had a i have also had a mustache like this in high school <laughs> and, I, and i and i'm growing it out for november as a firm thing and it will be probably Immediately shaved off on December first. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> yes, um, good. Um, Come on. good yeah, and and the and the hair dye is just called silver and gray. That's just <laughs> what happens. So it's just getting old. Thank you for noticing that as well. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. So um, and we we have on here. So we touched. We have two, two topics that we we've kind of touched on a little bit, but not too much. It's RESPA and licensing. And yeah. Do we have any rapid fire topics we can get through from that sure. perspective? Yeah, so RESPA is, uh, I'll say RESPA is a big issue right now. I, I get calls on it almost every day. And these are Section 8, that's RESPA is broad, right? But RESPA Section 8 calls where somebody is trying to get money into the hands of somebody else in connection with referrals of some type. And there are a variety of different ways that people try to do that over the years. There's, there's nothing really new in RESPA. But it's just a, a cyclical kind of a ramp up and ramp down in terms of risk appetites. So there are a lot of things that people can do. And, and I guess they're, the only novelty in this area is that some of the fintech companies believe that they've come up with some, some types of, of platforms that, that maybe don't exactly fit within RESPA and they, they have questions there. But by and large, it's the same as it always was. Um, but you do got to be really careful. And, and with the new administration, which we presume is going to happen, we don't know for sure 100% yet, but we assume it's going to. And we do know that uh, the, the people who are on the transition team focused on building out the CFPB, that's people that we've seen before, and we know some of them. And, uh, you know, they are, they're from the Cordray era. And so I would expect that, especially because of the, also the racial justice kind of a notion that's going around in the country, there's, there's a heightened um, appetite for, for going after some, some types of practices. And so I, I think we can really see ramp up enforcement um, in a lot of different areas, but including RESPA. And so, you know, marketing services agreements, people are asking about those a lot. Um, you know, renting of offices from real estate agents, that's come up. That's coming up a lot. Just the typical whining and dining, the plat, you know, the social platforms like whether it's Zillow, Zillow Realtor.com, etc., truly those types. Um, all of those are are areas where you really have to think through what you're doing 
uh, because it, it, there's a lot of there are a lot of people that think that those are some great avenues to develop business in, but there's a lot of risk in, and I expect that to be increasing over time here. Um, so I'll stop here on RESPA for a second and see if you have anything more. No, I think that's good. You know, I think um, we, we've ran long and we've gone over 10 minutes. So why don't we, we'll, we'll, we'll have to do it again. I think maybe what that's we good. do is we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do this again. It, and I really appreciate your time. Um, for those of you on the call, if you want any additional information, I think there might've been a question or two that came in that we didn't get to. We'll, we'll circle back with you and email you um, a response and, or jump on a call with you. Um, if you have any other questions, please send them over to us. We really appreciate you joining us. We're, we're trying to really make sure that we're living up to our core value of uh, being invested in our clients and giving them information um, that is valuable. Um, and we know people uh, are on Zoom calls uh, all the time. And so we're trying to keep them short. So I appreciate that. And um, if, like I said, if you have questions, please reach out. Troy, you have anything? Yeah, it's just, just the same thing. It's I, I, I do appreciate everybody's time and, and CWDL and, and the whole group is, all your team is awesome. And you. uh, we do appreciate it. It's great working with you on this. And yeah, uh, yeah if, if people have follow-up questions, happy to happy to chat with you about it. Yeah, we appreciate you being a resource for our clients and, and mutual clients. So that's yes. great. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and we're looking forward to doing this again um, in the next month or so. So. Sounds good. All Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks. Have a great week.